you read the title right. Uh, because it appears that the U.S. government is covering up the fact that the CIA basically enabled the terrorists who were supported by the Saudi government uh, to do 9-11. Um, and I, <laughs> you know, have been reporting on this kind of thing for a while, uh, not the least of which is Saudi involvement and in sort of coddling by the state. But, you know, this this is relative icing on the cake because essentially uh, what this proves is that Saudi Arabia, um, if this is indeed true and not one of the CIA's misdirection stories designed to prevent the fact that they, like, actually just planned it uh, and that's why all of that happened... Um, you know, Saudi Arabia had their hands in the cookie jar with regard to, you know, 9-11, and a bunch of people ran cover for them. Ran fucking cover for the Saudi Arabian government and the CIA. And I thought I would talk about that, um, but before I get into that, let me just, uh, say... I wrote about this a couple years ago, and I'm, I'm gonna, for the new people here who didn't know that I wrote articles or that, you know, I make content <laughs> uh, until recently because you're new, like, subscriber or whatever, um, I'm gonna read some of the stuff that you might not have uh, read from me before, and I'm just sort of, you know, sort of give this as a recap, right? Because I think it's valuable uh, to look back on what I've already been saying, and I also uh, think that this would relatively succinctly make the beginning of the point that I'm going to make here anyway. So, <clears throat> for agorasnexus.com, I wrote, uh, Will he, won't he, he won't, Afghanistan is too profitable to leave. And since then, by the way, there have been multiple operations in Afghanistan. So, I was right, you know. And also, uh, I made some points on Twitter that... <laughs> Even if he did leave somehow, it would only be to put troops elsewhere, to start a, a war with Russia elsewhere, right? Um, and, and what do you know? <laughs> the Ukraine situation sprung up. So I feel like vindicated more than a little. I said in this article um, in 2021, May 5th, to understand this properly, we have to go all the way back to the Carter administration when Jimmy Carter authorized the CIA activity in Afghanistan. Allegedly, this was to fight Russia, using Afghanistan as a base of operations. But what later was discovered was the existence of Operation Cyclone, whereby U.S. money and training was going to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. The U.S. sent Zbigniew Brzezinski overseas to tell Afghani citizens that the land of the north was theirs and that Allah was with them, cementing hostilities between the nations so that when they wanted to, they could aim the Mujahideen at Russia like a gun. The problem is these aren't weapons, they're people, and people aren't always going to do what you tell them to. So the forces that the U.S. trained would eventually result in a snowballing effect where they would become the forces now known as Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, ISIS, ISIL, and more. Hell, before the U.S. got there, there hadn't even been any suicide bombings. Suicide bombings became a favorite way to engage in jihad. For some reason, I wonder why. Except you don't need to wonder why. Because the profit and power motives for having a persistent enemy to fight are obvious. For instance, part of the funding went to a camp in Kost, run by a CIA asset, one Colonel Tim Osman. In an article titled, quote, The struggle against terrorism cannot be won by military means, end quote, Robin Cook, former foreign secretary in the UK, wrapped it up nicely. Quote, Bin Laden was, though a product of the monumental miscalculation by Western security agencies, uh, throughout the 80s, he was armed by the CIA and funded by the Saudis to wage jihad against the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda, literally the database, was originally the computer file of the thousands of Mujahideen who were recruited and trained with help from the CIA to defeat the Russians. 
inexplicably and with disastrous consequences, it never appears to have occurred to Washington that once Russia was out of the way, bin Laden's organization would turn its attention to the West, end quote. Tim was a founding member of Maktab Kadmat al-Mujahideen al-Arab, or Afghan Services Bureau. And to be clear, Russia is not some innocent flower. There were reports of torture and other war crimes, not the least of which was the arty bloody conflicts that were occurring in the region. And with or without U.S. funding and interference, the conflict would have happened. The question is, who would have been responsible and what would the results have been? The Russian government is also corrupt, and I have no problem saying that there are no good guys here. It's not as though the U.S. was coming after anyone pure. The idea that many people have, which is that the U.S. totally created anti-Russian sentiment in the region, and without them, the region would have been peace and roses, is false. Russia was an occupying force in the region and a certain aggressor. Millions of Afghans were being killed, and that's inexcusable. At th that point, were I in such a situation, I imagine I would reach out as well. Anyone willing to help would be a welcome ally. So the ASB became a funnel for training, armament, and more as a response to Russian aggression. It gave bin Laden his first real experience in leading these people, which helped him lead al-Qaeda in turn. So, why was the U.S. so eager to help? Before 9-11 happened, on September 10, 2001, then U.S. Secretary... Uh, of defense, Donald Rumsfeld said his department basically lost $2.3 trillion. I don't believe that for a second, and it seems like a handy excuse to hide a bunch of money used for things like black budgets, but how would you hide the fact that you allegedly lost that? Further, how would you make sure that nobody asks too many questions for fear of being associated with something? Enter the September 11th attacks. People pay most attention uh, to the two large towers that were knocked down. And there certainly is a lot to scrutinize there, not the least of which is eyewitness reports of explosions in the sub-basement before any explosions elsewhere, or the fact that a ton of tests had already been run to see how you could easily knock down these sorts of structures, or the fact that World Trade Center 7 was knocked down without being hit by any planes. And hey, don't pay any attention to the fact that a lot of the pillars look like they had been affected by some sort of thermite, that the buildings fell in near total freefall, or the fact that non-Arabs were arrested, or the planned attack on the George Washington Bridge, or a... Uh... Yeah, there are a lot of questions. But the Pentagon was also attacked. 38 people were in the section attacked, and the Army Budget Office was destroyed. Funny how that works. And if you thought that was a banger, get ready to guffaw. With exactly zero proof, the U.S. government immediately blamed Osama bin Laden, Tim Osman, their CIA asset who they spent decades arming, training, and funding. See, for a while, the U.S. government and Al-Qaeda, under the leadership of bin Laden, had been exchanging attacks. These attacks were regularly called retaliatory by both parties, and the U.S. government had already spent a significant amount of time calling him a villain by his new name. So, the fact that this person who had already been drugged through the mud would per perpetrate something like this was not an alien concept to the already indoctrinated American people. Afghanistan had basically lost one occupying force and gained another. But the U.S. government needed a reason to send in more, especially since they needed a windfall of profit. And what better way to soften the fact that your country is heading toward a centrally planned economic collapse than to engage in a war? They found passports in good enough condition, close enough to the impact site, that they could identify elements of his network as the perpetrators of the attack. At least that's what they want you to believe. This has led to a wide variety of jokes on the internet, where the idea of fireproof passports has been memed significantly. But they had already spun their narrative, and they didn't need the passports to convince conservatives to froth at the mouth. They just needed it for a few other people. The narrative worked, and people had a big rally around the flag and were suddenly united in vengeful thirst for a combat that most of them would never see. Armchair quarterbacking foreign policy is a great pastime of U.S. citizens. Scott Horton 
uh, wrote a great book on this subject, Fool's Errand. When he wrote on Afghani grievances, he said they were the U.S. Army and Air Force combat forces stationed permanently at Saudi Arabian bases since the preparations for the first Iraq war in 1990, as well as their presence in other countries on the Arabian Peninsula. The U.S. was using these military bases, bin Laden complained, to enforce the long-term sanctions policy against Iraq and the bombing of its no-fly zones through the 1990s. Bin Laden also routinely cited America's unconditional support for Israel, which both occupied Jerusalem, considered to be the third holiest site in Islam, as well as the property of millions of Palestinians in the rest of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Additionally, he objected to Israel's 1982 invasion and subsequent 18-year occupation of southern Lebanon, as well as what he characterized as Israeli-centric plans to destabilize antagonistic states in the region, such as Iraq. Another part of al-Qaeda's public case justifying its war against America was U.S. support for corrupt dictatorships in the Middle East, which included Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the UAE, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, Yemen, and Egypt. This support, bin Laden complained, came with the condition that these regimes keep oil prices artificially low and spend their profits on large purchases of American arms instead of using it for the benefit of the people, end quote. These seem like reasonable grievances, don't they? It's easy to justify conflicts if your enemies aren't human. But if you start to think of the perspective of your alleged enemies, a lot of things become much more clear. Like, how can you get people to destroy themselves in the name of destroying the enemy? The U.S., for a long time has supported a long series of civilian casualties in its effort around the globe, and this has not gone unnoticed. They have supported mass human rights abuses while claiming to be champions of human rights. Basically, the U.S. will engage in whatever hypocrisy is necessary to maintain their bottom line, even if that means innocent people die. Bin Laden had seen the machine up close and was already opposed to it, but there was no actual evidence that he had anything to do with the attacks. There was, however, incentive to not only profit and increase power, but silence a critic of the foreign policy resulting from U.S. funding because the original reason the U.S. went into Afghanistan was to stop a foreign power with whose evil they eventually competed. 40k dead civilians since 2001 and totally unnecessary. The U.S. eventually killed their CIA asset, but only after we had already got into Pakistan. They did it extrajudicially in the middle of the night, not on record, and then they chucked his body into the ocean. I don't believe that happened for a second, but I'm one of those paranoid conspiracy theorists, so I wouldn't anyway. The idea, however, of the U.S. maintaining true presence in Afghanistan nearly a decade after that is relatively absurd. This is why Afghanistan has been a political football for the previous three presidential campaigns. Obama promised to pull out and he lied. Trump promised to pull out and he lied. Biden promised to pull out and he lied. Recognize a pattern yet? So, that's what my article was. My driving was pretty good. Um, and I also wrote another article um, about how the U.S. gave the Taliban its roots. Because that Operation Cyclone, uh, that also formed the foundation for the organizations, the splinter factions that would eventually become the Taliban. And so the Taliban itself wouldn't have existed, or at least would have had a whole lot less weapons, money, training, etc., if the U.S. hadn't have made them. So what do you do with what you made? Well, you, you fund them. <laughs> I said, uh, if you'll remember from my other piece, the U.S. government funded bin Laden. His actual name was Tim Osman, and he was a CIA asset during the Operation Cyclone days. Well, the U.S. funding didn't stop there and would eventually go on to form the basis for the early Taliban government. The Taliban, you see, were the same kinds of mujahideen they had funded, and they would eventually go on to form a power group in the 90s. The word itself means students in Pashto. They were a coalition of inter-services intelligence directorate, CIA's puppet during Cyclone, and the Mujahideen. But back to bin Laden. He began the work of bombing embassies, and the Taliban quickly began running cover for him. But that dishonesty didn't stop the U.S. from totally believing that the Taliban government would act in their interests and keep promises in exchange for money. In 2001, the Bush administration funded 
the Taliban government, to the tune of $45 million in addition to other money that they were already giving them. This money, as referenced by many people, was estimated to be around $53 million in total. So, why did they get that? Well, they promised to end the opium trade. That didn't end up happening. Spoiler alert, but we'll get to that. Basically, they promised to prohibit it and to ensure that its production and exports stemmed. And to be honest, that would make perfect sense. The Afghan government and its neighboring countries should theoretically enforce the laws associated with Islam, and that includes sobriety. It would make sense that a Muslim-run country would have some sort of protections in place to avoid that sort of corrupting influence reaching the streets or in general being used, especially making that country known as a chief exporter of certain things that adulterate the mind. They had all the other hallmarks of a theocracy, so they might as well add that to the pile. They treated women and children poorly, banned music and TV, and jailed men with short or no beard, ran an apartheid state hinging on religious belief, controlled education, the economy, and more, so why not make the picture complete and also ban this obviously terrible substance? Well, <laughs> the problem with that is that the Taliban actively stored stockpiles of opium. And after the prohibition hit, the value of it only increased, and so did the exports, according to reports from neighboring countries. Just like before, the U.S. government had essentially worked with Afghani militants to increase their capability to export and profit from opium. Just like before, American theocrats, who would definitely support some sort of Christian centerpiece to U.S. rule, albeit rejecting much of what Jesus said, like not living by the sword and not serving two masters, walking in darkness and light serving mammon, had supported their fellow theocrats in Afghanistan, resulting in a significant amount of hardship to the locals. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, all the way to George W. Bush, all of them would help the operations that lead to the funding of the Afghani militants, all to support regimes that the U.S. wanted to install so that their interests would be served. The reason I used totally believing in quotes was because I don't actually think the U.S. government ever believed that they would keep their word and that they might have even known it wasn't going to happen, only using that as justification to appease the public. After all, they knew the Mujahideen were going to use the money they had already gotten to enact their particular vision of the law and the arms to militarily enforce their ideals on the region, and so the idea that they would also intentionally support this in another group isn't far-fetched. So, there's more to both of those articles. They'll be in the description. But now, for the actual news that's, uh, that's new, because I wrote that article about the U.S. creating the Taliban on August 23rd, 2021. Both of these are nearly two years old now. How's my fucking driving? Um, but just to, you know, put a fucking cherry on top, a little bow on this, Jacobin Magazine put out an article last year. Um, and that article that they put out last year has some interesting things. And I wanted to read some of these interesting things. We have new evidence of Saudi involvement in 9-11 and barely anyone cares. This is by Branko Marchetic. I, I don't know how that name is pronounced. Um, the FBI has quietly revealed further evidence of Saudi government complicity in the September 11th attacks and nothing's happened. Remember, I mentioned Saudi Arabia earlier. Put a mental pin in that, right? Um, and it says there's a lot going on in the world right now, so it's not surprising some news slips through the cracks. Still, it's amazing that explosive new evidence about an allied government's complicity in the, one of the worst attacks on U.S. soil in history has simply come and gone with barely any notice. Last week, the FBI quietly declassified a 510-page report it produced in 2017 about the 9-11 attack 20 years ago. The disclosure is in accordance with Biden's September 21 executive order declassifying long-hidden government files about the attack, which many hoped would reveal what exactly U.S. investigators knew about the Saudi Arabian government's possible involvement. They weren't let down. These most recent revelations revolve around Omar Abayumi, a Saudi national working in San Diego for a Saudi government-owned aviation company he never actually turned up to. 
Abayumi had long been the subject of suspicion, both because of his ties to extremist circles and due to the strange coincidences that surrounded him. From the job he never worked to, to the fact that he just happened to meet two of the future hijackers in a restaurant by chance, before finding them an apartment in San Diego, co-signing their lease, acting as their guarantor, paying their first month's rent and plugging them into the local Saudi community. Despite all this, and even though FBI agents had reason to believe he was a Saudi spy, something only revealed in 2016 upon declass of 28 pages of the 9-11 commission report that former President Bush had ordered to be kept secret, U.S. authorities exonerated him. The report ultimately concluded that there was no credible evidence that Al-Bayoumi knowingly aided extremist groups, while the Bureau decided in 2004 that he had no advanced knowledge of the terrorist attack, nor that the two hijackers-to-be were members of Al-Qaeda. Wow. So, it says the latest release makes those claims a lot less tenable. According to an FBI communique dated to June 2017, from the late 1990s to September 11th, 2001, Al-Bayoumi was a paid a monthly stipend as a co-optee of the Saudi General Intelligence Presidency, the country's principal spy agency. The document notes that while his involvement with Saudi intelligence wasn't confirmed at the time of the 9-11 Commission report, the Bureau has now confirmed it. In a separate 2017 document, uh, Bureau officials judged that there is a 50-50 chance that Al-Bayoumi had advanced knowledge of the 9-11 tax. Upon being told about the revelation, the 9-11 Commission chair, former New Jersey Governor Tom Keene, said that, quote, if that's true, I'd be upset by it. <laughs> He'd be upset by it, guys. He's just like us. <laughs> oh, it's fucking gold. And that the FBI said it wasn't was holding anything, and we believed him. Woo! You believed him. That's the extent of the FBI's fucking involvement here. They just believed people. Some invest a fucking gation. <laughs> Right? Right? So, 9-11 commission report, you just believed the government. Some commission! Holy fucking shit! Uh, more than that, the report directly implicates a member of the Saudi royal family and the government. Al-Bayoumi's monthly stipend was paid via then-ambassador to the U.S., uh, Prince Bandar bin Sultan Al Saud, it states, and any information... Al-Bayoumi collected on persons of interest in the Saudi community in LA and at San Diego and other issues, which met certain GIP intelligence requirements, would be forwarded to Bandar, who would then inform the GIP of items of interest to the GIP for further investigation and vetting or follow-up. This disclosure is particularly explosive because Bin Sultan was not just a member of the House of Saud, but was a close family friend with President Bush, and generally cozy with the U.S. political establishment. To the point that he was nicknamed Bandar Bush, close friends with Bush's father in more than two decades. I felt like one of your family, he wrote him in 1992. He later donated one million to the Elder Bush's presidential library. By the way, if y'all want to help me make rent, feel free to donate. The links are in the description. This content will keep coming. This friendship extended to the younger Bush, whose father advised him to consult Bin Sultan as he prepared to launch his presidential campaign. So close was their relationship that Bin Sultan was one of the first people Bush told when he decided to invade Iraq. In a markedly weird episode, the two met at the White House two days after September 11th attack and smoked cigars on the Truman balcony mere hours before chartered planes in violation of the nationwide grounding of aircraft picked up 160 royals, Bin Laden family members and other prominent Saudis and flew them out of the country. Gotta cover up your fucking plans! So let's recap what these new docs tell us. They tell us that one of the men who helped the two of the September 11th hijackers settle in the U.S. as they prepared to carry out their attack was in fact a spy for the Saudi government, a government long accused of supporting and financing fundamentalist extremists and the country where the vast majority of the hijackers came from. That spy was paid by and reported directly to the longtime Saudi ambassador to the U.S., a close and long-standing family friend of the U.S. fucking president. 
This should, realistically, prompt many questions, like, if Al-Bayoumi had advanced knowledge of the attack, did Bandar bin Sultan know too? Did the latter raise the alarm with anyone in the U.S., like his close friend the president? Was bin Sultan aware of ba al Bayoumi's assistance to the hijackers? Did Bush's relationship with bin Sultan cloud his judgment and explain his indifferent response to the intelligence warnings that came to his desk? What did the two talk about on September 13th? And why has the Saudi government faced absolutely no accountability over the fucking years? That might happen in a media ecosystem that doesn't have the attention span of a fruit fly. In the world we live in, the story has been covered by NorthJersey.com, by Democracy Now!, and that's it. The September 11th attack was a profoundly traumatic event that has irrevocably shaped U.S. foreign policy and domestic politics for the entirety of this century, often in ways disastrous for both the world and average Americans. Yet when new information implicating an allied government in its execution comes to light, hardly anyone ceases to care. But it gets worse because this year there's another article from Jacobin uh, that was released two days ago. It says, the mainstream media doesn't care that the CIA may have helped cause 9-11. This is more information that links all of this together very fucking nicely, especially given the information I just gave you from my two-year-old uh, articles that are both available on agrisnexus.com. Mainstream media doesn't care that the CIA may have helped cause 9-11. In an obscure court filing, dozens of former FBI agents and others allege that an illegal CIA operation on U.S. soil accidentally facilitated the 9-11 attacks. It should be a bombshell if only anyone in the establishment would notice. This is by Branko Marchetic. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce the name. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You can reach out to me on Twitter if you watch this video, Branko. For all the ways the September 11th attacks continue to shape U.S. culture and foreign policy, the event is still shrouded in a surprising amount of mystery. A recently unearthed bombshell court filing offers some possible clarity on the questions that continue to surround the attacks and their aftermath. And yet, like similar bombshells, that's the link I uh, clicked to read the other article, so you can just click that link when you click this one. Um, in recent years, it's been studiously ignored by the media and the political establishment. First reported by Rolling Stone contributing editor Seth Hatena on the Substack Spy Talk, the media project run by veteran former Newsweek national security reporter Jeff Stein, those potential answers come in the form of a signed affidavit from Guantanamo Military Commission investigator Don Canestraro. The affidavit outlines the findings of a 2016 investigation by Canestraro, a longtime veteran of the Drug Enforcement Administration, into Saudi and CIA complicity in the terrorist attacks, findings that are squarely at odds with the story given to the American public in their wake. Relaying the information gathered from dozens of interviews he conducted with former FBI and CIA personnel, members of the 9-11 Commission, and U.S. government officials, Ken Estrado's affidavit outlines the sequence of events that, if true, suggest a botched and illegal domestic CIA operation was at the heart of the intelligence failure that enabled the attacks. More than that, it suggests that there was a concerted cover-up of the grave blunder after the fact by both the CIA and the George W. Bush administration. The affidavit outlines the overlapping claims of numerous agents that the CIA impeded law enforcement efforts that could have prevented the attacks. Several former agents recall being blocked by the agency from sharing intelligence about the hijackers with the rest of the FBI. The CIA knew from wiretaps that two of the hijackers, Nawaf al-Hasmi and Khalid al-Minhar, had multiple entry visas letting them travel to the United States, one former agent said, but didn't pass it on to the Bureau. Two other agents alleged that the CIA withheld information about the two men's connection to the planner of the October 2000 Al-Qaeda bombing of the USS Cole, which, if known, would have turned the case into a criminal investigation for the FBI to pursue. One of those agents recalled a meeting with the CIA in which they were shown photos of three suspected terrorists, two of which would turn out to be future hijackers Al-Hasmi and Al-Minhar, when the agent referred to in the affidavit as C. S-12 asked who was placing border crossing alerts on the suspects, which would have notified law enforcement about their entry into the U.S., they were told no one was. <laughs> Later, when that same agent came across an electronic communication, 
uh, flagging that the two hijackers had entered the country, they were ordered to delete it immediately because having been obtained from intelligence sources, the dispatch could only be read by intelligence agents. A former senior FBI official likewise told Canestraro that the CIA sat on the news that the hijackers had entered the U.S. in 2000. Why did the CIA so intensely gatekeep information on the future hijackers? That same official bluntly asserted that the agency was trying to recruit the two as intelligence sources. CS-12 recounted that he was frustrated. Uh, in a conference call with FBI headquarters, in which they were ordered to stand down and stop looking for Al Minhar because the government was pursuing an intelligence gathering investigation on the suspect, something outside of the agent's law enforcement remit. In fact, multiple other witnesses told Canestraro that the CIA was hell bent on infiltrating Al Qaeda. That includes not only two former FBI special agents, but also Bush's chief counterterrorism advisor, Richard Clark, who recalled that Deputy CIA Director Kofor Black told him prior to September 11th that the agency had no human intelligence sources in the terrorist group and that, quote, he was resolved to address this situation and penetrate Al-Qaeda with informants, end quote. Canestraro recounted. It also included a former CIA official who had worked in the agency's Osama bin Laden situation. We know about that. Tasked with keeping an eye on and combating the terrorist leader, who told Canestraro that there was extensive pressure from CIA management to develop human sources inside of Al-Qaeda, according to the affidavit. Though far from definitive, these allegations line up with theories about the lead-up to September 11th that have long floated around, including in Ray Novoselsky and John Duffy's 2018 book, The Watchdogs Didn't Bark, The CIA, NSA, and the Crimes of the War on Terror, drawing similarly on claims that from former officials and agents, some of whom Hatena points out almost certainly overlap with Canestraro's own sources, uh, Nawasielski and Duffy had at the time made a somewhat speculative case that a failed CIA recruitment effort had accidentally facilitated the attacks. So, to recap everything, because this video is already running a little bit long, uh, to recap fucking everything... The CIA made Al-Qaeda, made the Taliban, made all these terrorist organizations because they funded them and created the basis for all of them. Then they uh, helped the Taliban facilitate the government necessary for the war on terror. And then they allowed 9-11 to happen. And it was a totally accidental thing. Um, but they also had a bunch of affiliation with the Saudi Arabian government, uh, and the Saudi Arabian government helped facilitate the uh, presence of the alleged hijackers in the U.S. Um, so that the CIA could attempt to recruit them and penetrate al-Qaeda. Um, but then the 9-11 attacks just happened, oh shucks, oh golly gee. Fucking... If this isn't proof that there's lies, complicity, and fucking evil afoot in the September 11th plots, I don't know what fucking would be. Tens of thousands of innocent civilians just poof because they got their fucking decades-long fool's errand, right? But hey... I'm just an insane conspiracy theorist over here giving you so many more reasons to smash the fuck.